Evelyn to Phil, December 8, 1942, 3.45 p.m. My precious Phil, this letter will be written in parts, one at the hospital and one at home. This morning the nurse took me to the nursery, showed me how to bathe the baby, and gave me a few important pointers. I'm dressed and ready to leave. I can't pull the zipper of my skirt all the way up, so I must have spread a little bit. I feel pretty good, just a bit wobbly, and can only sit on one cheek. I notice that Adele has a birthmark, a skin discoloration, a small one on her tummy. She didn't gain any weight today. She seems to be a quiet baby as far as I can determine from my three. Page two, daily feedings to her. I'll be able to learn her habits now that I must tend her myself. I'm considering myself an MP because I'm going to sleep in four hour shifts. She must be fed at 6, 10, 2, 6, 10, and 2 till I can break her of the 2 a.m. feeding. I understand mom was in bed yesterday and is today with an upset stomach and headache. I'll be able to tell you more later. My mom has been running around like a chicken without a head trying to buy and prepare all the things I need upon my arrival home. And believe me, she's done plenty. She was dead tired when she called me early this afternoon. The doc, page three, told me to have the formula prepared before I left. And I told her to sit down and take it easy or I'd get good and sore. Boy, you should have seen the list of things she had to get. You need more utensils, gadgets, and whatnots than you can imagine. They asked me if I wished to keep the bracelet on Adele's wrist, and I said yes. A dollar extra, the bums. At the moment, I am gazing at your picture, the only thing I haven't packed, and wishing with all my heart that you were here. There's a terrific lump in my throat and an ache in my heart. I almost wish I could stay here till January 20th so you could take us home. All in all, my stay at the page four Anderson Hospital has been pleasant, though just a bit too painful. Maybe someday, sweet, we'll come back when you'll be able to see me every day and take us home. 9 p.m. Lena, Ruth, and my mom called for me. I never wanted you more than at the moment we left the hospital. Adele and I are safely home, but the loneliness that engulfed me as I walked in the house was overwhelming. The bright colors of the house were blinding and confusing. Adele seems to feel the change of atmosphere and is a bit cranky. Everyone crowded around her, poor kid, but I quickly shooed them, page five, away. I too seem strange to the new atmosphere. I don't know what I'd do without my mom, bless her. She certainly knows what, why, how, and when. Mom was just generally upset and sort of grippy. She's feeling much better though. Goldie took care of her Monday and Glow stayed home today. Tante Shuj is spending the night here and will take care of the house tomorrow. My mom is going to sleep with Page six, me tonight, so everything so far is okay. I must visit Dr. R in four or five weeks with the baby, and we're both to have physicals. All in all, the bill total was seventy-two fifty, and I paid the doc five dollars, so our little girl is all paid for. And what's more, I'm glad all the details are over. I want to settle in to a definite routine so it won't be too tough on me. I didn't get your letter till this evening. Page seven, and honey, it was sugar-coated, and I was starved for some loving talk. Oh, baby, my loneliness is greater than ever before. Perhaps I am feeling for Adele, too. Take care of yourself, Daddy, and God bless you. I'm hoping that everything will continue as smoothly as it has been occurring. I'll write every last detail and keep you well informed. Page eight, Adele's daddy. And since it's getting late, I'll close with a big hug and oceans of kisses and love. 
Adele's mommy. Philip to Evelyn, Wednesday, December 9, 1942, 9 a.m. Sweetheart, the reason I didn't write last night was because I had the room orderly detail today, which means except for sweeping up in the morning and more or less keeping the barracks clean, I don't have a solitary thing to do outside of attending my correspondence. So I left the letter writing for now. What is more, I intend to write to Dottie, Sam, Mr. Farron, the Fromers, and anyone else I have time for. I didn't receive any mail yesterday, but I hope to get two letters from you in a few hours. And now for the news. Yesterday morning, we started school here on the base. We are to learn all the duties of a third echelon medium maintenance company, which in simple terms means that we are to become truck mechanics. Not very glamorous, but entirely necessary to the Army, I assure you. What is more, we are sending nine men at a time to different motor schools through page two, the country for specialized training. The first contingent leaves Saturday for Camp Holliburg, Maryland, where Eddie is stationed. How I wanted to be in that group, but my luck just didn't hold out. However, I may get an equally desirable break at some future date. Almost anything can happen around here, and usually does. In the meantime, our schedule is as follows. Up at 6, Roll call, 6.25, breakfast and drill, 8 to 8.30, school, 9 to 11. Then we lunch and rest until 1 when we go to the theater for training films. We get out at 3 and march to the gym where we indulge in a game that the non-coms like to call basketball but is really a cross between that game, soccer, wrestling, and football. After a half hour of this parody on legalized mayhem, we're all ready for the cleaners. Yesterday, I was so knocked out by the undue exertion that I just about dragged myself to my bunk. Whether I fell asleep or just passed out, I wouldn't even venture to say. But the next thing I was aware of was red woods shaking me to get me up for some cards. When I looked at my watch, it was 7 p.m. The two and a half hour nap, or blackout, served to refresh me to the extent that I won $4.50 from the boys in an hour. When I suggested to Red that we knock off and go page three to the movies, he readily agreed. There was a lousy musical, Rhythm Parade, which we just barely sat through. On the way back, Red told me his woes, all about his wife, girlfriends, etc., and very interesting, too. Remind me to tell you sometime. The other day, Monday, the training film was canceled, and in order to keep out of the CO's sight, the corporal marched us out of sight of the camp, where we intended to kill the afternoon. It snowed here last week, and the weather here has been consistently cold, so most of the snow is still around, especially in the ditches, where it is rather deep. Anyhow, to get on with it, we got to throwing snowballs at one another, for lack of other entertainment. Presently, another company came marching up the road. They were about 40 strong to our measly 15 men, the rest of our company having gone to the warehouse to exchange ill-fitting clothes. Nevertheless, we deployed ourselves in the ditches and busied ourselves making ammunition. When the enemy reached our positions, we let fly. We had the advantage of surprise and, page four, for about an hour we held them at bay. But finally, their superior weight of numbers began to assert itself and slowly but surely they took the initiative away from us until all at once they counterattacked. With hordes of snowballs coming at us from all sides, we slowly at first began to give ground, but we were sadly outgunned and reverses became retreat and rout in rapid order. 
In the final stages, we were forced to turn tail and run. I was so tired by this time, I decided it was much easier on the lungs to say nothing of my dignity, to stay where I was and fight a rear guard action. So while the rest of the company kept running, I crouched in a ditch and made snowballs as fast as my tired arms would let me. Of course, this suicidal maneuver was bound to come to grief, but I had the satisfaction of catching Jenkins a butte behind the ear before the pack was upon me. I didn't have a chance, so I kindly consented to being taken prisoner, which meant walking slowly home in the rear of the enemy's ranks, while the bulk of our company were forced to go at a gallop, halfway back to barracks. Luckily for them, at this point, someone spotted a rabbit, and in a jiffy, friend and foe alike were running after page five, the rabbit, and throwing what was left of the ammunition at him as he took off across the snow-covered fields. Can you picture about 50 soldiers armed with snowballs whooping and hollering after a madly scampering bit of fur? That's what I was thinking as I watched from the road. What an outfit. What an army. Oh well, it was fun for a while. That is, until you got so damn tired we could just about manage to drag our weary feet back to barracks. Well, baby, that's about all I can say about me. It just occurred to me that you may be on your way home at this instant. It was just 10.30 a.m. Please tell me, sweet, what time you left the hospital. Maybe I'll be able to say I was with you in spirit on your way home, if not in person as we had intended. I think I'll put this aside for now as I want to read today's letter before I close this. 1 p.m. Shown up, just received two letters from you, Chippy, and they are just as sweet. Page six, as they are lengthy. I can't get over marveling at the consideration everyone seems to be showing you and your daughter. I too wish we could be together when you come home, dearest but we have to learn to pass over as lightly as possible those minor misfortunes, which I assure you are of major proportions only to our eyes and hearts. Just try very hard to keep them smiling when those things happen. Don't let down even when you feel you have ample justification for doing so. It helps no one, not even yourself. Don't ever forget your morale is my morale. Together, we must keep it high. Agreed? Okay, Chippy. January 20th has to come sometime. And when it does, well, I don't have to tell you what being together once again will mean. Don't for a minute let those rumors distress you, Ev. It was about Camp Hollibird, which I mentioned above. Just another one of those things you learn to shrug off with too bad. Glad to hear Adele is starting to pick up weight, and glad, too, that she is attaining a hold on your affections. She'll be such a comfort to you, I know. She'll fill the spot I once occupied in your heart until I return to claim it. That spot that warms at the... Page 7, Mere Presence and Feel of a Loved One. For the time being, I'm content with that other spot the one that longs for and sometimes cries for the return of a loved one. You are lucky, my darling, for both those niches are filled for you. For me, only the latter nook is occupied, but it warms me clear through. The truly unfortunate being is the one that has neither the presence nor the image of his loved one residing in his breast. The thought of you is ever with me, and is the prime influence over everything I do or say. I adore you, my Evie. Harry's birthday card was being thought about, but not yet bought when I read your reminder. Right after lunch, I bought one and will send it off with this. It was good to hear from Jeanette and Herman. Send it along, will you? They must have moved since we saw her last because I'm sure the address was 1001 Arctic Avenue. I expect to get paid tomorrow for November and will send you whatever I can spare. 
Are you allowed to kiss the baby yet? If you are, then kiss her for me. I wish she were a little older so I could instruct her to kiss you for me. Page 8. I love you both so very much, my darlings. Love to all from Papa Phil. I'm trying them all. Postcard to Ruthie, Ev's sister, dated December 9, 1942. Dear Ruthie, here at last is the card I promised you. Please forgive me for delaying it so long. I'm feeling fine and hope you are the same. Give my love to all, including your brand new niece, Adele Barra. Love, Phil.